Hey everyone, um, I think that was um, overselling my <laughs> mastery in <laughs> data and analytics. <laughs> uh, but uh, hey everyone, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's the last session, but yeah, you're all here. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Sangarshanan, and this is Build a Database with Python. So it's a good idea. Is it or is it not? Let's find out in this talk. Cool. So uh, I'm going to be using like a lot of code in this talk, um, and most of them is kind of inspired from DDIA, uh, which is designing data, data intensive applications. It's an amazing book, so check it out if you haven't. It's by Martin Kleppman. Uh, and uh, the code for the slides and the slides, everything will be available on the QR code. So you can just check it out and you know look at the code, because it might be a little small in the screen and it might be a little hard. So uh, it will be much easier that way. Cool. So before we uh, you know start about building a database with Python, let's you know take a step back and uh, take a uh, come on a journey with me to my uh, past. It's a little uh, flashback. So I I I'm going to tell you a story and imagine it in black and white because you know it's it's from the past. Um, so I was an intern um, at a company which I'm currently working in. Um, and I was in a meeting where they were discussing, you know, backend systems and, you know, how we're going to build like an application, and they were deciding on which database to use. And I was an intern, right? So I was all like excited, and I was like, "Guys, you know what we should do? We should we should, we should use these cool DBs." Like I was just mentioning like random names, like Spanner, Cockroach DB. I was mentioning like, uh, like uh, there's there's Dole, there's Git for data. We, we we can use like amazing things. Like let's do it. And uh, uh, the senior person in the room immediately recognized that I was the new intern, and he like pulled me aside after the meeting, um, and he gave me a little piece of advice, uh, which kind of stuck around with me till now. Uh, so he told me that uh, whenever you want to you know, build an application, a backend system, and you want to choose a database, uh, go with Postgres. Um, and if you don't want to go with Postgres, give me three really solid reasons you are not going to be using Postgres for this. And if you can convince me with three reasons, then you know what? I'm going to start debating with you. Like I'm not going. To, I'm not convinced yet. I'm going to start debating. Until then, don't even talk to me. Uh, and I kind of felt weird because I thought that devs, you know, loved playing around with the cool new toys. You know, like the, the new thing pops up and we just start using it. Uh, but with databases, that doesn't happen, right? Like we have these industry standards that have stuck around like since the 70s, which is as old as my dad. Uh, which is like nuts. Like we, we we like to use cool new stuff. Like why are databases like sticking around for so long? What's so awesome about them? What's what's so mystical about them that you know take a single database that's existed for so long has become a standard and is continuing to be the standard. Uh, and actually, the short answer is the community of people who maintain and develop it for us. Uh, but still, you know, it's standing the test of time. And software normally doesn't stand the test of time. So uh, that's not a good enough reason to build a database, is what I learned by talking to sane people. Uh, so here are some other reasons where we, why you can go and build a database on your own. Uh, so the first reason is you can uh, break down abstractions. Uh, databases are like black boxes, right? You exactly don't know what's happening inside. You write a query, it gives you a result. Uh, you just like spin up a Postgres instance Docker run, and then you just write a query, you insert data, you query it, it comes out. What's happening though? Like a lot of people don't understand what's happening. They just, you know, work with it and it works. It works out of the box. Um, and but when you start working with it, you have these bad performance issues that you face when you start working with databases, right? So people write bad queries, uh, bad things happen, like really, really crazy things like uh, uh, like a one in a million chance where you have two things running in parallel, there's like a clash. It's like a really weird bug that sometimes happens in databases. Uh, and then if you write good queries, you have fewer worries because I'm, I, like, I work as a data engineer and you know, good queries make me really happy. Um, and it's fun. It's a lot of fun. So. Building databases is fun. Cool. So as this uh, Victorian man once said, what make a database? Oh, make it a database. Um, and when I started going ahead uh, wanting to build my own database, here's what I thought a database looked like. So, ah, so that's me. And I thought there was a base that I talked to, and there is data. I, I, I don't know where that is, and I don't know what the base is made of, but this is essentially what a database looked like? I don't know. I thought it was. Uh, maybe it is. We'll find out. Cool. So the first part we need to figure out is the base. 
So base is how you communicate with your database. That's how you talk to your database and essentially figure out how uh, we are going to do that. We're going to use our terminal to do that. Uh, and uh, to do that with our terminal, to talk to a database with the terminal, we're going to build something called a repo. And Python is awesome in this way, where you can build a repo really, really easily. So uh, I'm going to use something called a prompt toolkit, uh, which can be really easily used to just spin up a repo. So this is the code I was talking about. Uh, so, what, so what this code essentially does is just spins up a while through loop in your terminal, so it creates a REPL for you. And then you have this mambo jumbo, which is like, if you, if you want to quit the while through loop, you have to press Control D and Control C. So for that, I just have these exit conditions. And essentially what's happening is there is a function called the query executor. Uh, now the query executor executes the SQL, the query that we give to the database, and it gives the results. So we're going to look at what exactly this query executor does and how it can be used to talk to your database. So what is SQL? SQL is uh, structured query language, marks to me. Uh, it's just the language our database is fluent in. Uh, and there are like so many dialects of SQL that it you know, puts me to sleep. Uh, it's, a, it's just a query language. This, uh, there's, uh, there's so much SQL to explore, but I'm going to define like a really simple grammar for SQL for my own database. So this is going to be my simple grammar for my database for now. Uh, so we're going to have uh, we're going to have uh, DDLs, DMLs, DQLs. What do what do those mean? So uh, it's data definition language, which I can use to define something in my database. And then I can use DMLs to manipulate something in my database. And then I can, I have wildcards like star and stuff. And then I also have my query languages, which is like from, where, and stuff. So this is what I use as my grammar, essentially, for my SQL. So uh, yeah, so we're going to look at the query executor next. So now we have figured out how to talk to a DB. We're going to use a REPL. We have the query executor, and we have SQL. So what this query executor does is it's going to just parse your query. It's going to try to understand it. Uh, and once it understands it, it's going to plan uh, its execution. And once it plans its execution, it's just going to execute it, and it's going to just give you the results. Simple. It's not. Let's, let's look at what essentially each of them is doing. Um, <laughs> Cool. So first, I start by writing a very simple query, right? So it's going to be select star from customer, where name is Jojo. And that's a Jojo reference. Uh, so now the query gets parsed. Um, and as it, get pa as it gets parsed, our uh, database is going to know that you know, select is a DML, star is a wildcard, from is a DQL, and customer is a keyword, which is essentially my table reference. And then you have where, name, the operator, which is equal to, and you have the left-hand side of the operator and the right-hand side of the operator and the operator itself. So your, database, your query executor essentially parses this and understands that you know, this is that, and I have to do this. So once you have defined this grammar inside your query, you can now create a plan. Uh, so uh, for the query plan, a database creates something called an abstract syntax tree. This might sound awfully similar to what programming languages do, and that is true. Essentially, that's how compiling English works in computers. Like It generates a plan, it has ASTs, and then it kind of executes that. Uh, so it's the exact same concept. So it generates this tree for you. So this tree is generated based on the query that I just wrote. It's like star from uh, customers where you know name is Jojo. So once it has that plan, it has to just go and execute. So it knows that it has to select all the data, which is a bad idea, by the way. Do not write select star queries. Uh, do not listen to me. S select the columns that you want to select. So a database knows now what to do, right? Like it, it knows the query. So it has to just go and execute it, and it does. But where is my data? We just discussed how to talk to a database. So our base part is kind of clear, not fully clear, but it's there. And now we have the actual data part which is the fun part. So to start with, I thought, you know, why not just you know, save the data to memory? You know, no big deal. So first, I started by defining an in-memory uh, database. Um, so it's a hash map for every table. And I just insert a new key every time someone wants to insert something. So when I execute this, I just define my database, and I have test, which is my table name, and I just do a dot call the insert method with the name and the 
actual name and then I insert age and then when I do a db.select it kind of gets the value out for me. So this is actually a really simple database that I just wrote in a single class in Python. It's technically a database but there's one thing that's missing that's persistent. So if my class is run again the data is gone. It's like poof it's in my RAM. It's not in persistent anywhere right like so to do that remember to flush. So uh, what we can do is essentially rather than writing to a dictionary we can just like append to a file uh, and I just have an encode so that I write it in binary and not like as a text so that I save space. Uh, and when reading records uh, if we encounter a key that does not exist or has been deleted by someone we just return something called a tombstone and for my tombstone I'm defining an actual tombstone emoji which is a bad thing to do because it it occupies a lot of space in in your database so don't do that but it's fun so it's, it's a tombstone. Cool so what I loved about having uh, data in memory was her ability to look up things super fast and the flexibility to choose hash maps uh, or dictionaries in Python because it's super easy and flexible but the problem is that my file is going to grow really, really big as I keep appending new things and I have to go through my lists one by one if I have to find out a single row, which kind of sucks. I don't want to do that every time. So how do we fix this? Uh, we fix this by using a cache. So we're going to bring back our in-memory dictionary. And by the way, that's a Wu-Tang reference. Thank you. Um, but rather than making it our primary data storage, our hash map, we're going to make it kind of like a cache, right? So we're going to have our data in the disk and then we're going to have a hash map that's going to store references to the data on the disk. So what I just explained is just indexes. Uh, so it's an additional data structure that we kind of write to, uh, which makes our reads much faster, but we just have like an extra write that's going to happen on every write to the database. So it's going to write to the file and it's going to write to the index and when you want to look up it just looks up the index and it just finds where the data is exactly. It doesn't have to go through every single line of the file. Cool. So hash index is essentially just a dictionary. So it's going to look like this. If someone's, so if someone's looking for key 2 they can directly seek the ninth byte offset in the data file. They don't have to go through 0 to 9, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4. That sucks. So they just go to 9 directly and they get the data that they want. They're happy. Cool. Uh, so this is the implementation of the hash index. This might look really shit on the screen. So the code is there on the link. So you can take a look at that. Cool. So the problem with uh, hash indexes, uh, which is here, is that like if you know the length of a record, we can actually get it and it's really fast. Uh, but the problem is again, we have append only logs, right? That's, that's getting written to and we are eventually going to run out of disk space and our file is going to get too big. Uh, so to solve this, we're going to break down our files into segments. Cool. We're going to break down our files into segments and then we're going to start closing the file and then we're going to start writing to a new file and then we're going to just keep having like segments of files that, that is going to get written to which means we will also have duplicate inserts, right? So a, a same record can get inserted twice if someone wants to like replace it. Uh, so what we do to fix this is we run a process in the background where we kind of combine these segments into a single segment. Uh, so that process runs in almost all databases I guess which uses uh, indexes. And this process is called compaction. So compaction in databases essentially mean you throw out duplicate keys and keep only the recent update of every key and you do that in the background so that the user doesn't know what's happening. So this is, ex this is essentially what compaction is doing and this is just from DDIA. Uh, so it, it, compaction generally makes segments like much smaller and we can also merge several segments together at the same time. Uh, so what happens is segments are never modified but it's essentially written to a new segment. So you have these two old segments and there is a new segment that gets created and these old segments kind of get deleted or vacuumed is what databases call it. Uh, so after compaction we kind of switch our read request to the new segments and we kind of ignore the reads that happen in the old segment which are vacuumed or deleted. Cool. Awesome. So we, are, we have solved for lookups. It's super fast. We have append only writes. That's awesome. We also have like crash recovery now because we have an in memory data structure and also append only logs. So we can recreate our state if something happens. And we also have concurrency 
by the way, because we just have a single writer that's writing to files and you can parallelly read because it's a single state that gets created, right? So you can just read the segments parallelly. It's gonna have this, it's gonna return the same state. Uh, but, but there are, again, two problems here that we have to solve. So one is that there can be a lot of keys, right, which is a problem. And then you can also have range queries, which is, again, a problem. So to fix the problem of range queries, we're gonna just sort our segments by key value pairs. And uh, we can easily sort our segments by using, by not just appending to a file and just having like a hash map, we can just use something called a balance tree, right? And there are so many balance trees that are there. Uh, so what I'm using is like a red black tree. It's like a self-balancing special binary search tree which can like hold sorted data in memory. Uh, so if you want to know more about in-memory balance red black trees, uh, you can check out other Indian men on the internet who can explain it in a really better way than I can. Uh, so essentially what it does is it just maintains a sorted structure in memory so you can actually have it in memory and it's sorted and you can look, up, look, look things up really easily. So again, we don't have persistence because our tree is in memory. It's a data structure, right? It's in memory. So we need to convert this in-memory tree data structure into something that can persist on a file. So to do that, there is something really, really cool that people have come up with a very long time ago, and it's still a standard in the industry right now, something that's really awesome. That's just a B tree. So what we do is we take the nodes of our tree and we convert them into fixed size blocks or uh, pages. Uh, because that's how things are written in disks, so we use pages and blocks to write it. So it kind of conforms to how OS writes it, so we can just use our OS to do the same thing. And each page consists of a pointer reference, so we can kind of looks like this. So it's like we have a root node, and then we have all the keys, and we have references between the keys. The number of references is called the branching factor, and uh, we just have these child nodes. Kind of, it's a, kind of like a tree, but on our desk. So we just have nodes, we just have references, and we just branch out. Uh, so a quick fact, here the branching factor is four. Um, if we have a branching factor of 500 and four different levels, we can store data up to 256 TB, uh, which is like awesome. So you have a small tree that can store a lot of data. Cool, so again, there's gonna be I'm not going to kind of break down how inserts and updates work in binary tree. Like, there are a lot of tutorials for that. Uh, but essentially what it does is it tries to insert into a tree if there is space. And if there is no space, it just breaks the tree into like two different levels, like, and then tries to insert it into the nearest level. So it just maintains a sorted order. So it's like you have uh, 250, uh, 251, right? Uh, and then it just has to find out where it is. So it's like 100 to 200, it's uh, on the second level, and then 200 to 300, it's in that level, and it has to just keep traversing through the tree till it finds where the data should go in, and it can do inserts and deletes based on that. And if there is no space, just break the key, break the tree. And then, you know, create two different trees, and now we have more space. Sorted. So that's how it works. Uh, B-trees has been around for a long time, like since the 70s. Uh, and it's almost the basis of every relational and non-relational database that exists. And with B-tree, the operations make sure that the tree is balanced and it always has a depth of O of log n. It's never more than that. So, uh, so B-trees essentially solve a lot of problems for us, but we can do a lot of things apart from just this. Uh, rather than overwriting a page, we can create a copy of the page that we have on B-trees, right? Uh, and just like change our reference. And by doing that, we can actually do something really, really cool. That's MVCC, which is multi-version concurrency control. So rather than just overwriting, we create a copy and just change the reference so that if a transaction is happening, it has access to both the old pages and the new pages that branch out from the old pages. So it's kind of like Git, right? So you just have these. Uh, kind of, uh, what do you call these, commits that come out of a page, right? So it's just like you have multiple commits as everyone does. And if you're writing something, you have access to only your commit. So the data is always at the state that you queried in. So if you want to know more about this, talk to me. I'm super excited about MVCC, so I can talk about it all day. Uh, and also we can have uh, something called val logs, which databases use. So every operation to a B tree can be appended uh, to uh, append only logs so that you can recreate the tree whenever you want. Uh, 
And also there are several amazing things that I haven't broken down about the database. Uh, you can implement asset transactions. I haven't even gotten into that yet. A database is completely not asset. It's very stupid. Uh, you can do a lot of things. You can uh, also uh, kind of have transactions. That's not something I have implemented or started with yet. That's another possibility. Uh, it, it kind of gives you goosebumps. You can make it distributed as well. Right, right now it's just one person can create the database, right? Like now you can also make it distributed where multiple people can create the database at the same time and you have the same state that gets returned every time. Uh, and you can do that by you know, just having MVCC implemented. So you just have multiple references. So it's, it's kind of linearizable. So every, every operation to a database can be traced and it can be placed in a single linear timeline, even though it's happening in parallel. Uh, that's another interesting concept, uh, which I would love to talk about if you, if you all want to. Uh, yeah, so there's so many things that, I, that you can do in the future with the database, but to start with, this is how you go about building it. So that's what I wanted to just talk about. And uh, I am done. Thank you so much for coming and listening to my ramblings. Uh, and yeah, any questions, just shoot, I'm here. All right, uh, so if any questions in the room, please line up next to the microphone. And again, anyone online, don't hesitate to ask questions. Go ahead. So this might be a silly question, but my database knowledge is non-existent. Well, now I know a little bit. When you talked about compaction, it, so you showed a, a nice example where you had lots of repeated things, it's so it was pretty obvious that you were gonna get something smaller. But what if there's not much to compact in the two segments? Will you merge them and get a bigger segment, or will you not compact them? Uh, we still, uh, it kind of depends on the size. Uh, so we just have like fixed size for se uh, segments. So if the compaction is going to make the segments smaller, we kind of create new segments. Uh, but duplicates happen only when there is new inserts, right? Like if there is no new inserts for the database, we don't need compaction, so it doesn't run. Like it's, it's, it, it runs, but it doesn't compact. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Any questions online? No? Great. Hi, thanks for the interesting, but like lots of information coming to me, something still processing. I have a question like your last sheet. Um, you showed a hands emoji. Is that, is it praying or is it a high five? Oh, this one? Yeah. Uh, it's a pray, it's like, oh. thank you. <laughs> could have been a high five. It could also be a high five. There you go. Thanks. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, we still have several minutes, so don't be shy. If there's anything burning in your brain about databases, he's the guy to ask. Uh, you can also reach out to me after the talk, anywhere. I'm just going to be roaming around, and I'm the guy with the shot, so yeah. <laughs> So just a quick question regarding the wall, so the right ahead looks? Yes. Um, I can't really remember, but basically is, is it serialized? Is it only one writer that writes at a time in that log, and that's why you can reproduce history when you read it, if you reconstruct the log later on, if you have a crash? Uh, yeah, so while logs essentially have just like, uh, so in, the, in this implementation, it has like, so there are like two different kind of logs. So uh, in the standards that are there right now, MySQL and Postgres, they have like, Postgres has wall logs and MySQL has bin logs. Uh, essentially, it just writes every operation that happens to a B3 and it's an, and a single writer thread. Uh, so it just kind of appends every operation, uh, even though they kind of happen in, uh, like it can kind of happen in parallel. If we have the timestamp that's associated, like a logical timestamp for every operation that happens. It kind of appends it to like uh, append only log and you can, so wherever your database kind of crashed, you can just like rerun those operations top to bottom, like just in the order it's written to and your state will be recreated for the B3 and you can run queries on it. Hi, uh, why is Postgres the best database? Ah, I did. <laughs> uh, I did not say Postgres is the best database. If I said, I am I'm sorry. Saying that, but I don't know why it is. Uh, so I just mentioned Postgres because that's something that like I have been told by like my mentors and people who are like I guess like but know things better than me. But it's it's like one of the standards 
standard rdbms that people use so it can be both postgres and mysql like so i just mean postgres slash mysql so if you want to if you want to write an application you just use postgres mysql for it because kind of anything that you can mostly think of that's not you know super niche you can represent it in a relational manner like even though you think that you want to scale something you want to use something else you can represent it in a database and you can write far more performant queries on rdbmss so i just meant like rdbmss so i just mentioned postgres but it can be postgres mysql oh yeah that explains a lot yeah, thanks cool <laughs> So you have a working example of the database. Can you touch a bit of limitations of that working example, like constraints, limitations, uh, et cetera? So oh, yeah. So one of the constraints that I faced was building this in Python, uh, <laughs> which is, which is which is which uh, which is a which is a problem that I haven't touched on in this slide because it's a Py, it's PyCon, uh, but it's kind of difficult to do OS level operations in Python that I realized. So if you want to work with pages and stuff like that, I mean you can do it in Python. So to implement a proper B tree in Python, you cannot have like really fine grained access to like the pages and like the disks and stuff like that. So they're like M maps, like uh, how POSIX is written and like how you have access to these pages in your file system. Python doesn't give you fine grain access to this it's kind of abstracted into like a module that it lets you use the os module uh, so that's why databases are written in c plus plus so if you want to write a production database maybe think twice before you use python so yeah that was a thing that was a constraint that i got through by like uh writing to a writing to like a very hacky implementation of what I thought was a file system, but it wasn't. So it barely works. So it's it's a toy implementation. It's a toy database. It's not like a production database. It was just a learning experience for me. Yeah. Uh, so you basically built a, a REPL for this uh, toy database. Do you also have an API? So can you use it from a Python code, or was it just as a REPL? Uh, a what? Sorry, I didn't. So basically, can you use it from? another Python app. Do you have like a... Oh, got it, got it, got it. Got it. So uh, I did not implement like a client for it uh, because it doesn't run anywhere like on the server. It just is a REPL interface. But that would be fairly easy to do. Like I would just run it somewhere and I could just add like a JDBC uh, kind of on top of it. Yeah, it, it, it just needs a driver, yeah. yeah the follow-up question would have been about what kind of isolation level do you offer? But if you don't have a if you have only one client anyway. Oh yeah, so yeah. That, uh, that's what I touched upon on the, the, the previous slide. Like if, what, what if like, there are like several people using it like in different interfaces, right? Because right now there's just like one REPL that someone can open. Uh, so in that time, that's when like asset comes in. Like you have to make sure that you uh, run, like the modifications to the database happen in like a serialized way so that you can have it in a timeline. Uh, yeah, that's something that you have to kind of ensure uh, it's a big problem, right? Yeah, it's a big, it's, it's a big problem. So I think that that's one thing you can solve by you know creating a copy every time. So whenever someone queries a database, you take a snapshot of the state that's a database right now, and you make changes to that snapshot, right? And if someone writes another query, you make changes to that snapshot. And if somebody commits a transaction, and if someone writes a query after that commit, then you take from that commit. So you always, everyone always has access to the state at the current time the query is running right now. And if, the, if there is a mismatch in the state when somebody is writing to the database, you just say, you know what, it timed out, like there's an error or something like that. So that's like a very cheap way where you can ensure that it's, there is no like clashing things happening. So that's one way that I try to do it. Cool, yeah. Uh, oh, so that's what I defined like previously, like in my grammar. Uh, so if someone writes a query, I just tokenize it, and then based on whatever the key that I've mentioned, I know that like select means that they want to select something. So it's a defined grammar, which cannot be changed. So someone cannot write like, give me this, and I cannot give them that. OK. I don't think there's any questions online. So let's thank Sangar Sanan one last time. Cool. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>